This is a production of KMmedia.pro. Welcome back to Positive Talk Radio. Our goal is simple, to explore evolving ideas one conversation at a time. So come on over into our world. I know you'll like it, because on today's show... Today we are going to feature a really cool... Can I say really cool dude? I don't know. Nathan, can I say really cool dude? Yes, as long as it's every person out there. Because uh, <laughs> everybody's every, a really cool dude or, or dudette. dudette. <laughs> yeah, ex- exactly. And uh, uh, by the way, it, it's sunny today. Is is this going to happen all weekend? It is going to continue. And if you've been getting tired of the heat, well, good news is going to lower in temperature into the upper 60s throughout the week ahead. But no sign of rain in sight and partly sunny, mostly sunny skies ahead. So pretty mild and pleasant out there. Very nice uh, springtime temperature week. Really cool. Okay, that, that, that that's that's great. By the way, uh, Nathan, when when you were younger, or I don't know, you may, may be doing it now. Are you ever? Were you ever an actor? Did you ever ever think about you wanted to be an actor? I did take a few acting classes when I was in college. And do you do you want to be a professional speaker? A professional speaker? I never took a public speaking class. You're so. <laughs> how could you? How well I don't want to get into that but but the, our guest today has done all of that and he's also an author and uh he's going to talk to us today about what's it take to be a public speaker to really to engage an audience to be a master storyteller to do all of those sorts of things and he does a really really nice job of that and uh if you want to go to his website you can go to seantylerfoley.com and you can learn all about him and if you have a desire to be a speaker, um, a professional speaker that actually, I don't know, you know, like gets paid, wouldn't that be nice to go be able to talk to people and get paid for it? Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, well, maybe someday. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so let's go ahead and welcome um, uh, Sean Taylor in. Uh, to, Sean, how are you, my friend? Oh, I'm doing well, Kevin. How are you today? I'm awesome. Thank you. It's great to have you here. We talked the other day. Well, it's been a little while, but we talked about uh, you and your work and what you do. It's 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 great fun. Oh, yeah. No, I really enjoy it. And as you were saying to Nathan, wouldn't it be fun if you could get paid to speak? And I do. I have actually since I was six years old, as you alluded to. So I uh, I have enjoyed the fruits of that labor. And it's a it's a fun gig to have when you can get it. Oh, by the way, um, um, Nathan, before you go. I've got to I've got to drop a couple of names here. Can I do that? Sure. Um, Just don't drop see- them on my foot. I'm not wearing hard-toed shoes. <laughs> well, have you ever want did you ever watch the movie Freddy versus Jason? No. Did you ever see the movie Door to Door? Nope. Did you ever see the movie Ken? When were these movies produced? Well, 2002 <laughs> to 2004. Oh, so they are in my time frame. No, I have not <laughs> seen are. those. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now to be fair, Carrie is a remake of the original, which was done way back in my day, which would have been the seventies sometime. And uh, he, and uh, Sean was in all of those and musical ragtime. So it wow. wasn't all slasher movies. It was it was actually a a. Um, well, I, I'm not familiar with that one either. Are you? Slasher? No, no, no. Uh, ragtime. Oh. It was musical <laughs> ragtime. Phenomenal. phenomenal uh tony nominated uh broadway production and we lost to lion king that year <laughs> and it just crushed my heart oh uh, that, that that would not have hey, been if i'm gonna song. lose to uh something it would be lion king yeah well you know the power of the mouse you got you you got to tip your hat <laughs> exactly <laughs> so does that mean that now did you get to walk the red to carpet have you ever done that uh, I have, but not for the Tonys. I got to do it with the Golden Globes for door to door, actually. Oh, very, very nice. What's it like? You know, th- that's one of the things that I like to ask folks that have done unusual things. One of which is there aren't very many of us that can actually say that we walk the red carpet and and uh, brush. You know, we brush up against Angelina Jolie or or Brad Pitt just kind of wanders by and says, "Hey, Sean, how you doing?" And all you know, kind of that kind of thing. So, uh, what's it like to do that? 
Uh, for me, it was really, really surreal. I I got to do it so randomly. Um, it the that whole production for door to door was just a, a dream, to be honest. And um, the a call had gone out, and because we'd filmed, they they they'd had an extra seat at their table because the, the Golden Globes are weird. They're not like um, the Oscars where you sit in uh, in seats. You sit at at tables. And uh, so they had, they had an extra seat. Some I can't remember who couldn't make it. And they basically asked anybody in the cast. Uh, they'd sent it out through the agents and said, hey, who wants if anybody would like to come attend, they can be our guest. And uh, I was like, I, I could go because I was working for an airline at the time, because right when you're an actor, you're never just an actor. And right. uh, so my side gig was the airline. And I did that because I could fly to New York, to L.A., to Vancouver and Toronto on for next to nothing very smart which, which made you know doing this this gig of of acting and performing quite uh, quite easy to do and so i was able to get down to la i think it cost me 22 dollars, and they arranged for the limo i had to rent a tux i think it was 115 and uh and then i i, I went in and they they picked me up they did the thing nobody knew who i was so i had you know i had the I, I had to wear a lanyard. All the rest of the stars don't have to wear their lanyard when they walk the red carpet because they're doing all the pictures. I had to keep my lanyard on me so that people were like, no, 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 he's, he's with us. He can, he can be here. And, and I had to show my, my uh, invite and everything. It was, it was really, really cool. But what made that so amazing was to be in a room with, with, with stars and and to see people who you see up on the big screen and i'm i was nobody and still i'm still a day player nobody knows my name and it's great i, I can maintain my anonymity and, and enjoy it so but it was really really cool to see because you only ever see it i've only ever seen those things from the the tv right from one view from a camera lens and to be able to actually like walk through and like go to some of these other places that they just don't show and the red carpet's actually pretty long, like this whole processional thing that you do. It's 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 incredible. It's amazing. So so when you were walking up the red carpet and somebody with a microphone came and shoved it in your face, did they say, who are you? No, that's the beautiful thing. Nobody shoved a microphone in my face. I just kept walking past all the people like E.T. and all the stuff. Right. And uh, I don't even think at the time TMZ even existed because this was way back, way back. Uh, this is over 20 years ago now. And, um, and so, it, you know, they didn't even know who I was. And, uh, and that, again, that made it really cool because I could, I could be in it and outside of it at the same time and feel included, but still be an outsider. It was really, it was, it was, it was quite bizarre. It was kind of like, almost like you weren't really there. Exactly. Because... I was a ghost. <laughs> nobody was looking at you nobody was saying hey that's who's that you know and stuff like that so that's so did any particular star um really uh, impress you or or was it was it just like they're normal people uh for the most part they're just normal people um i didn't like i said i didn't really get to mix and mingle I, like at the golden globes that was it was a unique thing i was there uh as a guest of bill and uh and that was you know that was really cool um it just even i i the whole again that whole experience filming door to door i remember uh the first day i was on set the only day i was on set because i was a day player i had i had a scene um it was a nice scene it's a, a meaty scene in fact it's the scene that they used when um helen was when they uh, put up because she was nominated that year for best supporting actress and the scene that they played was her, Bill, and me doing this diner scene. And so it made me look like I was supposed to be there, which was so cool. But it's, it's, it's just, it, I mean, it happened to be the media scene that she had in it. And, and it, was, it was quite interesting. But I, like, honestly, I didn't, I didn't talk with anybody. I didn't even go to the after party. I, didn't, I, I don't really drink and socialize. So I was invited, but I didn't, I didn't go to any of the after party things. And it was just, it was just a fun thing for me to do. But what made it interesting was when we were actually filming that day, um, it was a night scene and um, William H. Macy plays Bill Porter. He's a real life guy uh, from the Pacific Northwest. I believe he was uh, originally out of Oregon before he moved to Washington and uh, was a door-to-door -door salesman for the Watkins company. So door-to-door -door is about his life. 
Oh, and, wow. And William H. Macy goes from young Bill Porter to old Bill Porter. And so he had a lot of prosthetic makeup because uh, uh, Bill Porter uh, had cerebral palsy. And he had very distinct ears, so they did a lot of prosthetic stuff for Bill when he was playing Bill. And uh, so in between the makeup bit, uh, I was in the makeup trailer, and Bill was in the makeup trailer, and I was kind of tapping along because I'm a drummer. And he goes, oh, do you drum? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, I'm just learning guitar. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And we chatted about music for a little bit. Fast forward about an hour later, they're still setting up the diner scene. He gets out of his makeup going from young Bill or from old Bill to young Bill. And... Uh, he comes in he's like hey do you mind if i uh if i pop into your trailer and jam with you for a little bit and i'm like no so william h macy came in with an acoustic guitar and i had that was the other thing too it was the first time i ever got a star trailer now i'm just a day player so like normally they stick you in the honey wagon you get a little jail cell type thing that's next to the bathroom and it's like a little four by eight cubicle and you just kind of sit there and you're like cool i've got a couch and i'll sit down I had this double wide star trailer that had its own bedroom and bathroom with like a stand up shower and flush toilet and all the rest of it. And then I had this big, huge living room area with like a dinette and a, like a little kitchenette area and the big sofas, two sofas and, and, a, and a, a little chair, like a recliner. So he sat down in the recliner. I had some friends that were in the trailer and we just sat and jammed and sang songs with Bill Porter, who was, you know, played by William H. Macy. That is that's a great story. Thank you. I uh, appreciate that because that that is uh, you know yeah, and you've got a ton of great stories. You your career really started very very young, and first of all, I, I'm I'm sorry for the loss of your father uh, yes. at six years old uh, with a uh, car accident, but uh, uh, but that got you into acting and that got you into into really putting yourself out there. What do you think it was about you that wanted to put yourself out there? You know, I don't know. Genetics. They like I was I was a born performer. If, uh, if you ask my mom, I was tap dancing in the womb, you know, so like I I, <laughs> I was always that kid, like two, three years old, wh who would be want to do a magic show, like watch this magic trick. I can do, you know, pick a card kind of thing. I, I'd always want to entertain the relatives when they'd come over for dinner or special occasions. And I remember doing like like I said, magic shows and puppet shows, stand up routines. Like I would just, I was I always wanted to be look, look, look. And I, I it just, you know, it was an obvious choice for me. I, when, as you'd mentioned, when my dad passed away, um, my first grade teacher, Judy Nielsen was the first one to really encourage me and then encourage my mom to do it. And she said, you know, this is probably a thing that, um, that Tyler could really do well. And I remember in the sixth grade, um, one of my teachers, Mr. Stone, um, further, he was always in, in the arts and he, he worked in our local theater, uh, company at Dudney players. And he really encouraged it too. So I had a lot of people over the course of those formative years, you know, grades, probably one through nine, uh, who really supported me and said, this is a thing that you could do and, and could probably do professionally. I know, um, my teacher, my seventh grade teacher, uh, one of my seventh grade teachers anyways, Miss Aaron Weeb, got me, uh, really put me towards joining Arts Trek. And then I went to the Alberta High School of Fine Arts. So I, I got to go to like, it was like fame only in Canada. It was fun. And, uh, you know, he's singing and dancing and, and acting and, and you do the performance and there's a big show at the end of the year. And, and our and that's the other thing, too. Like most people do a high school production. You have like a couple nights. We had like a four week run with main stage five nights a week plus matinees. Like it was a big to do. So I I really I don't know. I just I, I lucked out and I, I guess I'm I'm blessed and, you know, genetics helped. They did. And you. by the way, you're you're not. You're not hard to look at. Even, even, thank you. even I can even say that as a guy. Yeah. Uh, well, I, and uh, this is uh, and to be fair. I just finished getting off set, um, so I, I probably still have a little bit of makeup on. <laughs> so <laughs> that helps. What are you What are you doing now? What, what's What's the uh, play the player production you're doing now? Uh, I'm doing a, a movie based on a uh, real life event from the Pacific Northwest. I do a lot of Pacific Northwest, apparently, um, that I'm not allowed to tell you the title of or who's starring in it currently because of the NDA I had to sign. But 
It will be in theaters next year, and you should be able to check my IMDb profile in about six months, and, and it'll be updated, and it'll say, you know, it, upcoming uh, productions, and then you can see what it is. But I can tell you, in the last 25 years, this production is the most fun I've had on a show since probably Door to Door. And it is actually exceeding my the the how much fun I had because I've had multiple days on it. I've gotten to work with a lot of the stars. I I I've had a, a really good interaction with the director. The crew is phenomenal, and I wish I could tell you what the name of it is. So you'll just have to stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, isn't it amazing that you know I was listening to um, Tom Hanks, and they had done Toy Story three. And he was just in the crowd, and somebody shouted out, "So is there going to be a Toy Story 4? And and he just said, "You know, well, yeah." And uh, the next day, he got a call from the Disney attorneys, yeah, saying that this could affect the stock price, and that you're not allowed to talk about any of that. So that's why you have to sign the NDE, huh? Yeah, yeah, we have, and it's funny too. Like uh, a lot of times, before you can even audition for it, there there was a. Uh, production that I can talk about now. I wasn't on it, but I had to sign an NDA for it, but it's released now. So the NDA is null and void. Uh, when The Last of Us was filming up here in, uh, I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and uh, the the whole series, the HBO series was filmed up here, the first season of it anyways. And just to audition, we had to sign an NDA that said, you will not talk about this. You will not. And they even like changed names within the script. So you didn't actually know who you'd be acting with because it was pretty public knowledge that Pedro Pascal was playing the lead in it. And so they would change stuff up and you didn't know what it was. And you'd re it was super secretive. Like, and, and they were very like, I, all of my sides, which are the script that you get to, to do the audition were not only did they have my name in it as a watermark, but the time that it was sent to me, on what date and when i opened it it all got detailed in in the watermark so if i leaked a script or something they would know who did it and they could come after you and they were like you do not talk you know you we don't talk about bruno we don't talk about the last of us <laughs> <laughs> it it's amazing you know i've, I've talked to several actors and in, in lately and there is so much more that goes into it than you think when you are just you know watching a movie play out um it's it's like how there are times when i can just imagine that you're saying i'm in this movie it's great it's gonna be great and then you invite all your friends and you go see the screening and you're on the cutting room floor oh yeah yeah so that's, that's been me a thousand times and in fact i I, the one that I'm filming right now, I am a glorified extra, but the uh, producer and director liked me enough that they actually wrote an additional scene for me just so that I had more dialogue so that I wouldn't get cut. <laughs> I was like, that, that is so awesome. That, like I said, this production, I am just glowing. I have never felt um, more seen or more appreciated as a performer, as an actor, more supported um, than I have on this show. Like the the, I wish I could tell you the name of the director and the name of the of the cast because these they're they are top notch, and I hope I hope at some point they're able to see this and put two and two together and know that I was talking about them. Well, it doesn't uh, the director doesn't start with an S and end with an S, does it? No, but wouldn't that be funny too? <laughs> <laughs> that would be Steven Spielberg, but uh, that's that's just that's just me. It would be. It, I would love to. You know, I would love to do what you do because that that is for me. I was a stage actor, and there is nothing on this planet that is more rewarding than to putting together a, a great performance and having people uh, cheering for you and stuff. It's just it's it's remarkable. Well, and that's why I like stage over film. Like, make no mistake, I am loving this gig right now, but it is a film production and there isn't that instantaneous feedback. Like, I remember after the, I was on the first day of filming. So I was, uh, my filming schedule was the first two days and then the following week. And then I don't go back again for a, a month. And then I'm the last two days of filming. And so when I was the, we were first on set, 
uh, it's the first day for everybody. Everybody's getting to know everybody and, and learn and, and explore. And I have I just finished the week prior to beginning filming this project. I just finished doing a musical. And so I was used to, you know, every night hearing instantaneous feedback. And on this first day, um, I, I remember messing up my line after about the 20th take of this scene that we were doing um, for our coverage and things like that. I was good for the first 19 times, but then they... <laughs> Then they actually turned to do my coverage because, again, day player. So I'm last in line to get my coverage. And by that time, it was hot in this set that we were coming in. My mind was mush and I couldn't say my line right. And I'm like, they're going to fire me. I am not going to see day two because after this, I don't say anything and they really don't need me here. They're just they're going to be like, this guy is not working out and just cut me. And they didn't. I was blown away. <laughs> I was like, wow, they like me. They really do like me. <laughs> Just like Sally Field. Just like Sally Field. Yeah. So so it's great. I'm glad to I'm glad to see your uh, career is taking off for you because well, it's exciting. It's you know it's it's funny because it's reemerging. Like I had a, a really nice renaissance in in the early 2000s. Right. If you look at my IMDb, that's when all of the work that I did was. Uh, or at least the work that is publicly recognized, because I've been doing it since I was six, but it was a lot of regional theater productions and small roles on films that were filming up here that, again, never made the cut, you know, was left on the cutting room floor, never made the final edit, or just uh, they were, they're so small a project that you'd never even heard of them. So I've got a resume that's like this long, you know, you, I've had to like shrink the font on it, and like <laughs> lose projects at the bottom just to keep it relevant. Uh, and yet still nobody knows my name. But in this last uh, year, first of all, there's been an explosion of production that has come to this area. And one of the interesting things that happened was during COVID, uh, there was a lot of there was a lack of, of an ability to film in some of these larger metropolitan areas that were traditional film centers. And so non-traditional film centers started to get more opportunities just because we were deemed as safer because the, the likelihood of contact with people is smaller and smaller populations, easier to control. Uh, being up in Canada, we've got you know universal healthcare, so it was easy to get a lot of the medical access. And a lot of these things played into getting a lot more production up here and as a performer, they switched from in-person casting sessions to virtual casting sessions. So now I auditioned from my great gray void and I don't ever have to leave my house. And so that has increased the number of auditions I've, I'm getting to go for and be considered for, which is increasing the number of productions that I've been in. So I, I had retired. Like I'd stepped away from this acting gig at like 25, 26. I went back to school. I got an engineering discipline. I had started my own business. Like I've done this other, I have this whole other life over here outside of acting. And I didn't get back into this really until my daughter was born. And it was only because at 11 months old, she got her first gig because she's super cute. Good, <laughs> good genetics. I married well. My wife is mwah, beautiful. And my kid got the best of us both except for our tempers she got a bad temper she got that for me and i wish i could change that but she looks great uh, she's just a kid and uh, yeah well she's seven now and she's still full of attitude and it's only getting worse so we'll see how it goes at 25 i think she'll tune herself out nicely and then she'll become a normal human being but uh but she had gotten these a couple of gigs and they needed somebody to play her dad and my agent was like well why don't you play her dad I'm like, I don't want to do this. She's like, just audition. I'm like, fine. And then I ended up getting three of these roles back to back to back, mostly because my kid is cute and because we were doing it in COVID. And so they wanted you to be in a family cohort. So I was just riding the coattails of my kid's talent. And then I got the bug again. And I was like, oh, well, fine. We'll do it. Well, you might as well. You're, you're having success and, and you've been doing some good stuff and it's going to, it's going to continue, but there's so, so, so much more to you than acting. 
<laughs> and uh, we, we need we need to talk about that in the second half of the show. Your speaking and your and how you help people uh, get out through the fear of speaking and getting out there and doing what they do. Uh, you're a very engaging young man. I can say that because everybody's an engaging young man these days for me. And well, not necessarily engaging, but. You, you um, have got a lot to offer humanity, and, and uh, it's, it's great to have you here. By the way, we are talking with Sean Taylor Foley, and which actually you go more by Taylor, don't you? Yeah, well, it, familiarly, because – so it's funny because, I, speaking of acting, why I have such a confusing name, my mother and my father argued over what my name would be. So they actually uh, – dad wanted – Sean, mom wanted Tyler, I think, if I'm if I'm right. And the compromise was they were just going to say it both. So it's actually Sean Tyler, like uh, like Jean Luc, like it's hyphenated. Ah, okay. But to go and tell people that your name is Sean Tyler, uh, it just makes you sound so pretentious. Like it's, <laughs> it's Sean Tyler. And uh, when I was born, the two most popular names of the year I was born were Sean and Tyler. So in my kindergarten class, there were seven Sean's <laughs> and none of us spelled it the same way either. We had S E A N like me, S H A U N S H A W N a really Celtic. Like I've got a Celtic spelling with S E A N, yep. but there was uh, one Sean in my class and it was like, what was S I O B I E A N. Like a thousand vowels to make one syllable. I don't know how it was, but it was Sean. It looked like Sihafi Bibiahan, but it was Sean. Um, and so, and nobody got that one right. I, I I remember being, you know, all through school and even now people phoning me and trying to pronounce my name and the number of people who are like, seen? I'm like, I'm not seen, I'm Sean. <laughs> But I'm glad that you are seeing Sean now. And uh, but I feel bad for him because the number of teachers who like third grade, like see how Phoebe Jovan was like Sean. <laughs> and, they, and you can see the confusion, too. Right. The teacher would read and they'd be like. How is this? OK, whatever. But it's super Celtic spelling. But so I went by Tyler because there were only two other Tylers in my grade and one of them was in the other class. So I became Tyler F and then there was the Tyler M and uh, Tyler C was over on the other class and he could just be Tyler on his own. And all the rest of the kids were named Sean, but it was an easy grade for my teacher in kindergarten because she only needs to know two names, Tyler <laughs> or Sean. And then we had Jen and Lisa. And yet there were 14 kids in our class and that was it for names. <laughs> It's it's amazing how we we all fall in love with the same names because my my younger son my younger son's name is Sean as in Sean Connery and yes. that's, and that's you know but the, and he spells it the same way you do so well because you have to because it's the proper Irish way to do it which is funny because Sean's Scottish um, and <laughs> one of my favorite things to do honestly is put on a bad Sean Connery accent I just did. And and go and order fast food <laughs> i've done it so many times there's if anybody who wants to they can go find my facebook i have a facebook post of me and my daughter we, i she we went to this uh father daughter dance this princess dance when she was like three years old fully catered meal with all kinds of stuff and they, they had a buffet you could have whatever you wanted they even had this ice cream buffet you could make whatever you kids dream right she didn't eat a thing. I want it. 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 We get into the truck when the dance is over. And she's like, I want McDonald's. <laughs> I was like, oh, of course you do. So I went through the drive through and Kenzie, my daughter, is talking from the back. And I'm like, what do you want? And she's like, you know, I want a Happy Meal. Yes, I would like one cheeseburger Happy Meal. But if you could make that burger up like a Big Mac. And hold on. What do you want to drink? Yes, we'd like a strawberry fruitopia if you could. And no ice for that. She wants just the fruitopia, please. Now I myself will enjoy one large ice cream if I could. And by the way, we are talking with Sean Connery, and uh, he is, <laughs> your, your accent is much better than mine. Oh, I don't know that it's good. 
I would, I, I, but it's, it's what I do and how I do it. And I'm not going to change it. No, sir. No, sir. Not, not a bit. We're talking with, uh, Sean Taylor Foley and we need to take a break, but when we come back, we're going to talk about the other side of him, which is uh, pretty engaging and he works and engages audience and he can help you engage with an audience as well. You're listening to Positive Talk Radio and we'll be all right to big. Hey, PTR loyal listener. First, thanks for being in my dream. And second, I have a new concept in business to share with you. It's called socialpreneurship. So what's that? Well, it's the idea that any company designates all profits beyond expenses to be awarded to a local or international charity or project which is working to achieve good in the world. KM Media is such a company. We believe that it's important for us to give back whenever possible and to make great things happen. So I hope you'll join us in creating this new business model that will positively impact all of us. In the next few weeks, we will lay out the plan and begin our fundraising efforts. So stay tuned for more details right here on Positive Talk Radio. When you want to say more than words communicate, you can with flowers. Your custom boutique floral studio in Bothell, Washington is anaturaldesign.com, connecting you to nature through the language of flowers. Where your people are is where our flowers are beautiful. Your success is our goal. anaturaldesign.com at your fingertips today. Hey, thanks for listening to Positive Talk Radio. Did you know that we're also a media production company? Well, surprise, we are. We can create all kinds of audio, video products to fill any need. Please visit kmmedia.pro backslash our dash store for a complete list of products and services. In addition, do you need a great voice to add to your own website or any other project? I know that we can add depth and quality to your work. I've been told more times than I can count by many professionals in the business that my voice adds to the quality of the presentation. So let me create something for you. Please contact me at Kevin at KMmedia.pro and let's create something great. And welcome everybody back to Positive Talk Radio. My name is Kevin McDonald and I I'm not 100% sure that I should play a commercial about doing voiceover work when I'm talking to an actor. I don't know <laughs> that that plays very well. Well, I, I think people are not incorrect, Kevin. You have a fantastic voice. It's very, I would I would call it a character voice for sure. Like, it, I, I'm surprised you don't do more animation. I need, I, I'm stepping out there young man and i'm going to be doing some of that because i keep getting told that that in, you know when people tell you that you are supposed to be doing something and you ignore them for 20 years you probably um are wasting time so um i i think i i'm, I'm going to be doing that and and i love doing i love doing that kind of thing so just like just like you i'm a i'm a performer at at my core and I really enjoy uh, doing that and talking to people like you. And and thank you for that, by the way. You, and even if you didn't mean it, thank you. No, I mean it a thousand percent. <laughs> I I hear a lot of voices, particularly with when you're doing ADR, and I do I do some animation work. And you know, you 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 hear a voice, like you can hear it. You're like, oh no, like that would be that would be really good. I could I could hear you on Nickelodeon for sure. Oh, lovely. I need, I, I will, I will start applying and, and stuff like that, but let's, let's talk about you and what you are also doing. Now you're like, we talked about, you're an actor, you're an author, you've written the book, um, the power to speak naked, which is a, a skill all by, all by itself. Um, and the, the title of the book came to you. Why? I, so originally the book uh, came about as a transcript of a training course that I did. And originally the training course was called basic instructional technique. And we called it basic instructional technique because it was a, a designed for 
supervisors and middle management, people who had been put into a leadership or supervisory position that maybe didn't feel comfortable being there and had to lead meetings and didn't, you know, everybody says, right, 70% of Americans express anxiety around public speaking. And so that yeah. I don't do it. I'm not a public speaker, all those things that they say. So if you called it public speaking 101, nobody would come. But it's such a critical leadership skill. So we said, well, these guys are probably having to train people. So let's call it basic instructional technique, because that's all it is, is, you know, showing people how to speak in front of people so that they can get their point across. And, you know, acronym BIT. So I'm going to go take the BIT course and, and it just kind of worked. But um, my agent had, because uh, I am a public speaker and I do enjoy presenting and, and particularly to large audiences. And in order to get some of those larger paid gigs, uh, you, you need a book. And so my agent had said, listen, Tyler, you know, we've kind of hit the ceiling of what you can do without having a book. And we need to remodify your course, make it a little bit larger offering instead of a two day uh, course, maybe make it two and a half or a five day workshop. So we worked on the material and as I was recording and training it, uh, we just um, took the video and grabbed the audio off of it, transcribed the audio, and then that became the book. But the problem was we had all the text for it, but we didn't have a, a title and you couldn't call the book basic instructional technique because nobody would buy that. <laughs> so I was brainstorming with my team and one of my team members had said, uh, well, why don't you you know, I was, cause it's an advice book. And so I said, what's some of the advice that you've gotten around public speaking? And one of them came and you said, well, you know, if you're nervous, you picture the audience naked. And I went, no, no, you do <laughs> not. For so many reasons, that is the worst advice ever given on the planet. First of all, your audience should be treated like they're gold. You need to respect your audience. You need to leave your audience better than you found them. Why on God's green earth would you ever try to picture them naked and and this idea of, of gaining power over somebody else's discomfort is just so obtuse and, and just weird like why would why why there's so much why and so i go on a rant very similar to that and i went at the end of it i was like i would rather give somebody the power to speak naked than to ever tell them to picture their audience naked and everybody went "Ooh, that's that's good the power to speak naked. And then the more that we explored it on the you know surface level, I legitimately would love to give somebody the confidence enough in their own messaging and their story and their delivery that they could go give a presentation in the emperor's new clothes and nobody would notice because they'd just be captivated by their words. What they were wearing would be completely and totally irrelevant. So on its surface, I would love to be able to actually give somebody the power to speak naked. But as we explored it, Really what that means is I want you to be able to strip down your presentation to a, a naked presentation. You don't need a PowerPoint. You don't need props. You don't need uh, laser lights and AV and, and big screens and videos and all the rest of that stuff. You should be able to do what we're doing now, have a conversation and talk and have people listen because that's really the power. The power comes from inside you and the power comes from your voice. And then at its deepest root to do that, you need to be able to tell the raw naked truth, strip yourself down uh, metaphorically to, to your bare bones and be uh, expose yourself and be very vulnerable in your storytelling because that's what engages people. That's what gets people to understand your point of view and, and gives them understanding of your, of why you are, who you are and what you do, what you do. So uh, for all those reasons, the power to speak naked just stuck. And I was like, that is the title. That is what we're calling the book. That is what we're going forward. We're rebranding the course. The course is now the power to speak naked. And that and we just launched from there. And if you look at the, um, um, at the artwork of the book, uh, was that you that was standing there? Wouldn't it be great if it was, oh, this man, this guy here, he works out. He works out a lot more than I do. Look at the musculature on that guy. Uh, no, I wanted it to be. Originally, I wanted it to be. And we, when we were playing with it, first of all, I couldn't get the photo shoot arranged in time. And because we, uh, we were on a deadline. There was a reason I was meeting with my people because, the, as I said, the text was done. The manuscript was done but we had like a day to get the cover <laughs> the, the title for it. And then we had like a week to get the cover put together when it, before it was ready to go and be finalized. So I was, I was pushing a deadline and I couldn't get, uh, couldn't get the imagery done, but 
my publisher had a really good point. Um, when we were discussing it, she had said, I, I think you should have the, the speaker turned away so that people can step in to the speaker and that they can picture themselves looking at an audience. Because if you make it front forward and it's your face, then it's all about you. And in all of the discussions that we've had, you want it to be about the audience. So let's make it about the audience. Let's make it about your audience and let's have the speaker turned away. And then it's generic and anybody can step into that speaker's shoes. And I went, I like it. That's, that's, that's really good. It's almost like in your, in your acting career, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I was talking with another gentleman, he's in Vancouver, and he was saying that, that uh, the star of the show at one point was supposed to be uh, buck naked. And uh, so, but he didn't want to do that scene. So they lined up three or four stunt guys that then they could determine which butt was the one he wanted them to use. Yeah. Yeah. And those stunt guys are not even paid at a stunt rate. They're paid at a body double rate, which is just barely higher than an extra. So that, so you get, you get none of the credit, <laughs> all, all of the, the embarrassment. Exposure. And just absolutely no cash for it. And I have been that guy. I've been a uh, photo double and body double for a couple of stars, actually, in a couple of different uh, movies. And uh, you can see my butt quite clearly in a few of them. <laughs> so those are not on your uh, resume, I wouldn't Those ask. are not on my resume, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Well, it's it's like I was reading the other day that the, it was the, the, a movie first day of filming and the first day of filming, they were going to do a love scene. And yeah. these, it was like these these two people had they'd done a reading together, but that's it. And so they shook hands and then they did what they had to go do and and stuff. And that would be just bizarre. I've done that, too, oh, uh, where where you've been like I did. I did a couple of different episodes of uh, uh true crime recreation series called sex lies and murder and both on both of those on the first film day they're like yeah so uh tyler meet megan megan meet tyler hi megan hi tyler and now do it <laughs> you're like ah, oh, you're okay with this right like where and it's such I, I can't even begin to tell you how bizarre a scenario that is uh doing scenes like that it is it is just it's weird it is the only way to describe it, it is weird Nothing romantic about it. I want well, no. I can't. I can't imagine being in the scene where you've got camera people and you've got lighting people and you've got uh, um, uh, makeup people and all of these people. All these people are standing around watching you do what you're supposed to do. Well, and so they, it's essential personnel only. But it's amazing how many people are essential <laughs> when you're doing a love scene. And then on top of it, they have like I can't uh, an intimacy observer. So they're, they're, they're there to make sure that no lines are crossed and that everybody is safe and, and you have you have somebody that you can go to. Uh, it's usually a female and it's usually not. They're not usually concerned about my feelings. Let me tell you that right now, Kevin. It's not me that they're concerned about. So they always have like this intimacy coordinator and uh, and observer. And it, it, so like it's like one more person. You're like, yeah, this is weird already. Please go away. I can't imagine having that job. That would be that would, would be an interest intimacy advisor. That would be okay. You can put your hand there, but don't you dare put it there, kind of thing. And then that's exactly you have no idea that it is actually things that they say. <laughs> like you can place your hand here, but not here. Uh, the, I've I've actually heard the phrase no thrusting. <laughs> so it's, like, like, it's so oh you can't even know you can't. It's so weird. It is so weird. I heard an actor one time. Now, this goes all the way back to the Mike Douglas show. I don't know if you've, this is, goes, was a talk show way back when. And the and this was when love scenes were just starting to happen. And um, and the, the, Mike Douglas asked, the, and it was an actor he was talking to. And he said, um, so um, what did you say to her? And she said, he said, well, I didn't know whether to apologize for getting excited or not. So. It's a true story. You're like, I don't, I don't know what is going to be the bigger insult for you. So <laughs> let's establish that to begin with, because <laughs> where, what is going to disturb you more? Uh, it's so, it's just such, and it's such a weird thing. And I, I tell, I'm going to tell you right now from experience, having done multiple shoots of, of this nature, um, not, not, it's not, it's not happening. 
There, there's a, <laughs> it's not happening. There's a lot that happens, and that isn't one of them because there's a lot that happens. Well, well, you know, in the in the, the interesting thing about it as well is I heard, and I'm not going to say the actress's name, uh, but she's an actress of note. But apparently, she has a houseitosis problem, or she has bad breath. And and in a couple of cases, the sh- shooting had to stop because of it was not a the actor could not go on because of yeah. the kissing scenes and stuff like that with the bad breath and stuff. So yeah. it's it, it, even at that level, it's still just human beings uh, reacting to human beings. Hey, yeah, and that's and that's all that acting is. A- acting at its best is just reacting. You know, one of the greatest compliments I ever got from a director was, "You're a really good listener." That's a perfect- that in that, by the way, is a huge skill to have. If you, if you can be a good listener, then you can do anything. Mm-hmm. So and so, tell us more about uh, you are a, a public speaker and you help people learn how to be um, more engaging public speakers. Now, I wanted to mention this as well, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's been my experience that when people gather together in a room and then they are going to listen to you speak. Number one, that they're there because they want to listen to you speak. And in a lot of cases, they're in your corner already. They want you to do well. And people tend to think, oh, I'm going to screw up and they're going to laugh at me. And that really isn't the case at all. They are really engaged with helping you be the best that you can be. Do you find that to be true? Kevin, it's almost like you read my book, (laughs) (laughs) but you're exactly right. So, and that's, and that's usually people's biggest fear. So when people say that they're afraid of public speaking, it, they're not, I I can prove it right now. If your listeners right now have ever been to a restaurant and ordered food and didn't know their wait staff, not only did they speak in public because they were in a public place, because that's what a restaurant is they spoke to a complete stranger because they didn't know their wait staff and they asked for what they wanted and they got it. So this notion that we're afraid to speak in public or we're afraid to speak to strangers or we're afraid to ask for what we want, all of that's null and void. If you've ever been to a restaurant, ordered food and had it delivered to your table. And I can hear the complaint right now, Kevin, cause I can, I, it's, you know, a really good audio connection that you and I have. I can hear the audience right now being like, Oh, but, but <laughs> when I'm in a restaurant, and I'm ordering food, people aren't looking at me. And if that is your rationale, then you're not actually afraid of pe- speaking in public. You're afraid of public judgment. You're afraid of what people, if they, if the focus is on you, what you're going to do, what you're going to say. And so a big chunk of the book that we talk about is pointing out that the audience is actually on your side, right? Nobody tuned in to Positive Talk Radio today and thought to themselves, well, I hope Kevin sucks. We already don't like his voice. And the Sean Tyler guy sounds like a complete fraud. I mean, who can trust an actor and an author on top of that? Like, I I guarantee these guys have nothing to say. I hope they stumble over their words. I hope they bring no value to this conversation. And it's going to be boring. Like, that, nobody thought that or they just wouldn't have tuned in. Right. And when you and we as human beings are incredibly selfish creatures. So if we have some place better to be, We'll be there. We will find an excuse, especially in today's day and age in a public gathering. <coughs> just I, <coughs> don't feel so good. Maybe I should <laughs> stay home. And the, and the, that's your instant out. So if you have people who have gathered to see you, they're on your side. And on top of that, you are the expert because we don't ask second best to speak. So you are the expert your audience is on your side so what what is there to fear the audience is not a scary thing the audience in fact is one of the greatest gifts you could ever get and so your job is to just treat them like that golden egg and to leave your audience better than you found them and you don't have to do a lot to do that like we're talking incremental change you just need to give them one little bit or two little bits of, of information that they didn't have previously or get them to view something that they already knew in a different way and come to a different understanding. And you have done your job. So the, it's it's actually remarkably easy to, to do the presentations when you have the right mindset. And that's why most of the book is on mindset and not the technicalities of speaking. How many people do you run across that come to you 
to because they they're a CEO as an example um, of a of a mid sized company. It's important for the CEO to sound <laughs> number one coherent and number two positive and also that they know what they're talking about. How many people do you have to really coach to give them the the information that they need and the desire and the ability to speak as like it's not a big deal? Well, so probably 85% of my clients are exactly in the demographic the way that you described. Uh, an executive or CEO, mid-sized company having to do presentations. My very first private coaching client that I ever had was a mid-level executive at uh, an oil and gas company having to give um, regular quarterly presentations and um, safety town hall meetings and things like that. And he, he at first of all, hated the sound of his own voice. He just didn't like it. And I, I, I ripped off a, uh, an exercise from the King's speech. Uh-huh. And I, I made him, I saw, I, cause I saw the movie and I'm like, that's brilliant. And so I made him talk over loud music. I put headphones on and I made him just shout over top of it. And then I played it back for him. And I was like, this is what, this is what you sound like. And he's like, that is, that isn't me. I'm like, no, it's because what his big problem was that he would swallow his words. He was so insecure with the message that he was delivering, which was hilarious because he was a brilliant man, like multiple letters after the end of his name with a lot of commas, like, MBA and and whatever like a thousand different he he was so learned he was such a brilliant man and and smart acumen business acumen and and so very personable to have a conversation like this but as soon as he had to stand up in front of people he had this way of eating his words it was like he was breathing in when he spoke and uh everything was a question because he would finish it up here and it was weird because his actual speaking voice was like this. And so why, when he presented, he sounded kind of like he was almost uh, swallowing stuff was just bizarre to me, just bizarre. And it sounded horrible on a microphone. And so I, I, so I had him just yell and I'm like, so now let's, let's not yell. Let's just find power in our voice. And so we started working on the diaphragm, working a lot of stuff that I, I worked on in theater just to get him to have like just a, a presence within his voice so that he could show up. And then 90% of the battle was working on his self-confidence. I was like, I want you to stand in the mirror. I, I want you to Stuart Smalley the hell out of this. You're good enough. You're smart enough. And doggone it, people like you. Because it's all true. And you need to believe that before anybody else will. And we just worked on mental exercises for about three months. And he actually got feedback because one of the reasons he reached out to me was um, in they were doing like evaluations very progressive company for some about 10, 13 years ago. Um, and he, they were doing these uh, uh, evaluations on them, on their performance. And it was a big hitting point for him that he was boring when he talked. And so it was this big transformational moment for him when he could not be boring anymore. It became a really important piece of his persona and his career. Yeah. Because in, in even as a, in, if you're a mid-level guy like that and you're a CEO, you still have to go talk to uh, uh, stockholders and you have shareholders, to uh, yeah. board of directors. You're having to speak to uh, venture capitalists or, or anybody who's providing financing. Uh, you have to give presentations all the time. Um, you know, especially if you're, if you have multiple stakeholders within your business or even, even within your company, trying to communicate a vision. Yes. You know, why are people working for you? What is the, what, where are we sailing this ship? Cause you're captaining it. And if you're not captaining it, you're high up on the poop deck and you're probably, you know, in charge somehow. And they gotta, they gotta go. They, you know, they, they, people need to have a reason to follow you. And that starts with your messaging and your voice. I have thoroughly enjoyed this hour and it has gone by way too fast. <laughs> And I want to thank you, uh, uh, Sean Tyler, for being here. Sean Tyler Foley has been our guest. And to go to Sean Tyler Foley, and that's S-E-A-N, 
tylerfoley.com. Find out all the information about him. Hire him as a coach. I guarantee you, I, well, I can't guarantee you, but I'm willing to bet that you'll make more money because no matter what you're doing. And, I'll put that guarantee down. I will tell them that. Oh, there you go. See, we win. So, and I also, before we go, I've got just about 30 seconds. I want to make sure that everybody, every parent out there, if you have the ability, take your kid to an improvisational drama class. Have them learn how to think on their feet and to speak appropriately. Sean, I think you agree with that, don't you? I do. I do. I think it's one of the most uh, fundamental development skills that you can give a child it, for so many reasons. It, it shows them the power of their voice. It shows them the power of thinking on their feet, shows them creativity. It shows them uh, cooperative uh, nature. There's just uh, the list goes on and on. I could probably give 30 to 40 benefits if we had the hour to go over it, but we don't. We only have 30 <laughs> seconds. So please, yes, parents, take your children to an improv class. They would at uh, improvisational theater, theater sports, and uh, yes. they would they will it's one of the greatest gifts you can give to your child. And by the way, we have to go, but I want to tell everybody, be kind to one another because each other's all we've got. We'll see you at three on Kixie.